got me breaking down and aggravation has me losing ground. A strange scene on the streets of London. Myanmar's ambassador to the UK locked out of his own embassy after speaking out against the coup and calling for the release of the country's leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. The Myanmar military's brutal crackdown on opposition leading to hundreds of deaths, including dozens of children, according to human rights groups. New police testimony in the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin. A police expert says Chauvin used deadly force on George Floyd when, quote, no force should have been used. The defense raising questions about what Floyd is heard saying on body camera video about drugs while handcuffed and on the ground. The CDC reveals what is now the dominant strain of the coronavirus in the U.S., the variant fueling what could become the country's new surge. The CDC also reports young people are driving new outbreaks where health officials are tracking clusters of cases connected as dozens of states expand vaccine eligibility to 16 and older. President Biden sells his $2 trillion infrastructure plan, calling it a once-in-a-generation investment in America. Tonight, his answer to Republicans who say the plan is too big and too expensive. News about embattled Congressman Matt Gates and how he allegedly asked the Trump administration for a blanket pardon before leaving office. The former president's reaction tonight as the congressman denies allegations of any wrongdoing. The crash report is in saying Tiger Woods never hit the brakes. The golf superstar found to be driving nearly double the speed limit right before the crash severely injured him and a tragic, senseless loss of life, devastating the family of a promising young woman, how their grief has been helped by the marvels of medical science. That's the only, the only thing we had in this nightmare, the only thing we could hold on to, is that something good was happening. That she, she was a miracle for somebody else. Really a tearful moment there. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Eight days into the trial of Derek Chauvin, and we are now at the point where it seems virtually every aspect of what happened May 25th of 2020 is being revealed. Every word analyzed, and as the saying goes, the devil is in the details. In the courtroom today, that was as evident as ever. The prosecution and the defense clashing over what George Floyd may have or may not have said as he was getting pinned to the ground. The defense playing body camera video claiming that you can hear Floyd saying, I ate too many drugs. The lead investigator of the incident agreed. But then a short time later, when the prosecution played a longer version of the same moment from a different officer's body camera, that same investigator said he thought Floyd actually said, I ain't doing no drugs. Several other witnesses also taking the stand today. Our Alex Perez leads us off once again from Minneapolis. Today, an expert on the use of force is Sergeant Jody Steiger of the LAPD testifying Derek Chauvin used a deadly force against George Floyd at a time when no force was necessary. Prosecutors asking whether Floyd posed a threat. No, he did not. And why not? Because he was in the prone position, he was handcuffed, um, he was not attempting to resist, he was not attempting to uh, assault the officers, kick, punch, or anything of that nature. Did he ever uh, communicate an intent to do so? No, he did not. I didn't hear any verbalization of any threats towards the officers. Did he ever uh, indicate whether or not he had the ability to do so? No, he did not. The defense has argued the crowd of bystanders were a threat. I did not perceive them as being a threat. And, and why is that? Uh, because they were merely filming and they were most of it was their concern for Mr. Floyd. The officer, is the officer able to increase the use of force on an individual based on the conduct of some third party over whom the subject has no control? No, the officers can only use force based on the subject's actions. Chauvin's lawyers returning again and again to Floyd's drug use, arguing his opioid addiction led to his death. So somebody, if you ask, are you consuming uh, what did you take? What drugs are you on? And they deny that they're on drugs, but there's physical evidence 
to, to suggest to the contrary, it's a consideration an officer has to make, right? Yes. And in this case, officers asked Mr. Floyd repeatedly what kind of drugs he was using, right? Yes. You've had an opportunity to review the body-worn cameras, and you've seen sort of a white substance forming around Mr. Floyd's mouth? Yes. That would be consistent in your experience with someone who's possibly using controlled substances? Correct. The defense playing this body cam video to the chief investigator in the case, James Ryerson, listen closely. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. Did it appear that Mr. Floyd said, I ate too many drugs? Yes, it did. But later, the prosecution playing an earlier portion of that same tape. Is there a discussion about drug use by the officers and attempting to speak to Mr. Floyd. Yes. Having heard it in context, are you able to tell uh, what Mr. Floyd is saying there? Yes, I believe Mr. Floyd was saying, I ain't do no drugs. Late today, a forensic investigator on the case acknowledging that when she searched the police squad car where officers had struggled with Floyd, she missed a few pills, which were later determined to have Floyd's DNA on them. Didn't have any information that I was looking for anything like a pill or resembling a pill. Um, it was in the back seat of a squad car, uh, so I wasn't exactly sure what it was, uh, you know, if it came off of somebody's shoe. Um, so at the time, I didn't um, give it any forensic significance, given the information I had. The defense is arguing that Floyd spit the drugs out in his tussle with police. Alex Perez joins us now from Minneapolis. And Alex, the defense keeps going back primarily to these two things, Floyd's drug use and the idea that the officers felt threatened by the bystanders who had gathered at the scene. But the prosecution now seems to be really taking aim at that strategy. Yeah, Lindsay, the prosecution really trying to anticipate and get ahead of the defense here, uh, not denying Floyd's drug use, and also calling in all these expert witnesses who have reviewed all of this video, and they all essentially say the same thing. They do not believe that crowd of bystanders was a threat to the officers. Lindsay? And, Alex, it sounds like tomorrow we might learn if we will hear from George Floyd's friend who was in his car at the time of the incident. Yeah, Lindsay, that's uh, Maurice Hall. Uh, in some of those videos, you can actually see him. Now, he, through his attorney, has said he plans to invoke his Fifth Amendment right and not testify if called. You'll remember George Floyd's girlfriend, when she was on the stand, said that he had provided them with drugs many times in the past. The judge is expected to take up this issue and hear more about it from both sides tomorrow in court, Lindsay. Yeah, it sounds like he's concerned that he might incriminate himself. Alex Perez, our thanks to you. And for more analysis of the trial, we are joined again by ABC News contributor and a host of the Law and Crime Network, Mr. Brian Buckmeyer. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. Look, the state's witness, LAPD use of force expert Sergeant Jody Steiger, testified that from the evidence he's seen, George Floyd did not pose a threat to police officers and that Chauvin used deadly force when he didn't have to. How convincing were his arguments, especially since he's not connected to the case? Overall, it was pretty convincing. Of course, Eric Nelson kind of chipped away at his credibility, showing that he's not a Minnesota police officer. He's actually an outsider coming in from the Los Angeles Police Department. But when the prosecution put up his resume and spoke about not only his conclusion, that is excessive force, but also breaking it down time by time, giving the, the reason that here, force is appropriate, but at this point, it was excessive, I think that was very persuasive for the prosecution. And the defense brought up the point that Chauvin had an elevated sense of risk when he arrived at the scene. Was that convincing to you? Not overall. It makes sense. And I think it was actually a powerful argument that the prosecution could not combat. The very fact that what he heard over the dispatcher's radio, that he needed to show up quickly, does give officers all over this country a heightened sense of what they may see when they get there. But when I watched a video of him approaching the scene, he was very nonchalant. And I think if the prosecution can point to that, that may combat a very strong argument by Eric Nelson. And there are still, of course, open questions about George Floyd's drug use. The defense suggests that he may have died from an overdose. Let's listen again to this exchange in court today. Publish exhibit 1007, and I'm going to ask you, sir, to listen to Mr. Floyd's voice. Uh, 
Did you hear that? Yes, I did. Did it appear that Mr. Floyd said, I ate too many drugs? Yes, it did. But senior special agent James Ryerson on redirect says that Floyd may have said something else. I ain't doing no drugs. What was your takeaway from this dispute? Yeah, I think this is a very intelligent move by Eric Nelson. The only thing I would have done as a defense attorney is save that for the summation and for the very reason as to what we saw. The prosecution was able to adapt, alter their argument, and now we have the witness saying that's not what he said. He said, I ain't doing no drugs. And it kind of makes sense because the sentence, I ate too many drugs, doesn't really fit into the vocabulary or the way that George Floyd speaks. It makes more sense that he was saying, as the prosecutor showed in the context of that video, I ain't doing no drugs. And finally, the question came up again today whether Chauvin pressed Floyd's neck or shoulder blade and whether Chauvin had his entire weight on Floyd. What do you think the evidence shows at this point? And does it even matter when we see what looks like a man dying during those excruciating nine minutes and 29 seconds? It's slowly becoming a fact that doesn't really matter because Eric Nelson, as any good defense attorney did, he's driving home the idea that the knee wasn't on the neck. Then the prosecution is pivoting and saying, hey, simply being on the ground, having body weight on that person, whether it be the, the back or the neck, could lead to death. And so they're broadening their argument, making it harder for Nelson to pick that apart. But Nelson is very focused on the time that the EMT or EMS responders show up and not the nine minutes before that, I think the prosecution has a strong argument that for the duration of that time, Derek Chauvin's knee was on George Floyd's neck. Brian Buckmeyer, always good to check in with you. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Now to the variants versus vaccines. Some concerning news tonight that the more contagious and more deadly UK strain has become the dominant version of COVID-19 here in the US. Tonight, officials are urging Americans once again not to let their guard down. Roughly 109 million Americans have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. But what does the variant mean for Americans who are still waiting for that vaccine? Our Whit Johnson reports. Tonight, the CDC says the UK variant is the most dominant COVID strain in the US, highly contagious, believed to be more deadly, and now fueling what some experts fear could be the start of a new surge. I think we're way too high to be thinking that we've won this race. And the CDC increasingly worried about younger unvaccinated Americans tracking clusters of cases connected to daycare centers and youth sports. Hospitals are seeing more and more younger adults, those in their 30s and 40s, admitted with severe disease. Hospital admissions are on the rise in at least 16 states. Cases in Michigan nearly tripling in the last three weeks. Doctors there are seeing many children needing critical care. In Chicago, 18-year-old Zamaya Bell loved dancing and was a member of the Palm Squad. She brought light into the room. But her family says she got COVID in March, was hospitalized and went into cardiac arrest, her mom rushing to her side. Oh, I can hear in my head, don't leave me, mama. <laughs> don't leave me, mama. <laughs> Just stay with me. But Zamaya's condition rapidly deteriorating. The high school junior passing away from complications from the virus. Her mother tonight with a warning for other parents. This is not over. This virus is killing. No age to it, no no race to it, nothing, it don't care. More vaccines are starting to reach younger Americans. 38 states opening vaccinations for everyone 16 and older. I actually was tagged in a post that someone shared on Instagram. Um, so I just quickly hopped on it because it's very hard to find appointments. Those vaccines believed to work against the variants. And tonight, more evidence protection from vaccines will last. New data shows high levels of antibodies at least six months out from the Moderna vaccine. Antibodies delivered by vaccination persist at least through six months and likely from the shape of the curve well beyond that. And more than six months into its study, Pfizer also reporting its vaccine is highly effective. Some good news out of Pfizer there. Whit Johnson joins us now from a vaccination center in New York. And, and Whit, we've been reporting on the surge in Michigan. And tonight there's a new forecast saying it should serve as a warning for the rest of the country. How so? 
Lindsay, researchers at Policy Lab are using Michigan as a cautionary example, saying while it's easy to blame the variants for an increase in cases and hospitalizations, a key factor is that people have abandoned mitigation measures that work and that many Americans are traveling and gathering at pre-pandemic levels. Lindsay? Whit Johnson reporting in for us. Thanks so much, Whit. We turn now to Washington, where President Biden once again made his case for his infrastructure plan, calling it a once-in-a-generation investment in America. The president's plan makes the traditional investments in areas like roads and bridges, but he also says that the definition of infrastructure should go beyond that. Take a listen. We are America. We don't just fix for today. We build for tomorrow to automatically say that the only thing is infrastructure is a highway, a bridge, or whatever, that's just not rational. Senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, what's President Biden's argument for what should be considered infrastructure and how are Republicans responding to this broad plan? Well, the president certainly is offering a broad definition of infrastructure, including both what we think of as sort of traditional infrastructure projects, right? Roads, rails, and bridges like the one here behind me. But he also argues that infrastructure should include any of those kinds of goods and services that really can help the middle class survive and thrive. So this plan also includes billions of dollars uh, to replace every lead pipe in the country, also to provide broadband internet access to 100% of the country. So he's looking at this through this really wide lens, and that is not sitting well with Republicans, who argue that this plan is really sort of a, a list of Democratic hopeful, you know, wish list that's, that's masquerading as an infrastructure bill. And that is why you are seeing Republicans say, look, they're willing to talk with the White House, but only if they slim this down significantly. The president today suggesting he's willing to compromise with Republicans, but it does seem that that compromise uh, is only going to go so far. Because, as you say, this wish list, so to speak, many Republicans believe it's just too expensive. So much of this is going to, of course, come down to cost. The president said today that he's willing to negotiate, as you said, with Congress on the details. Take a listen. Debate is welcome. Compromise is inevitable. Changes are certain. We'll be open to good ideas and good faith negotiations. But here's what we won't be open to. We will not be open to doing nothing. Inaction simply is not an option. He says that is not on the table. And Mary, the president made his case for raising the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 28 percent to pay for infrastructure investments. That's been met by resistance from Republicans and by some key Democrats. So where is this likely headed? Well, it is headed uh, to a certain fight on Capitol Hill. That we know. Republicans, it is simply a non-starter for them. The president's plan to raise the corporate tax rate. Of course, the president has also said he's open to raising taxes on the most wealthy Americans, those making over $400,000 a year. Republicans simply don't want to see those changes happen. Now, the White House points out uh, that, that Republicans weren't, you know, bemoaning adding to the deficit when President Trump made his sweeping tax changes. And the president has said, look, he's open to alternatives here if Republicans want to put forth a different plan. So far, we haven't seen any, but the president is also making it abundantly clear that he wants to go big here. He has argued that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make these kinds of investments. And we do know that the Senate parliamentarian has given Democrats the go-ahead to do this just with Democratic support. But that is not a given right now. There are several Democrats who have voiced concerns about this. So while the president may talk about bipartisanship, I suspect much of the focus in the coming weeks and months during this fight will be simply trying to get Democrats united behind the president's plan. Lindsay. Right, trying to get them on board. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. Next, new developments on Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's under federal investigation for alleged sex trafficking. Sources have confirmed to ABC News and New York Times report that he lobbied the White House for a blanket pardon during the last months of the Trump administration. And former President Trump today weighed in. Here's ABC senior Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl. Today, Donald Trump broke his silence on the investigation into whether one of his most fervent supporters in Congress had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old girl. Congressman Matt Gates has never asked me for a pardon, Trump said in a written statement. It must also be remembered that he has totally denied the accusations against him. 
Gates may never have directly asked Trump for a pardon, but multiple former Trump administration officials tell ABC News that the now embattled congressman had urged the Trump White House to grant blanket preemptive pardons for Trump's political allies, including Gates himself. Gates had even talked about the idea publicly. He should pardon everyone from himself to his administration officials to Joe Exotic. I think that the president ought to wield that pardon power effectively and robustly. Sources familiar with the alleged request tell ABC the idea was quickly dismissed inside the White House. In a statement today, a Gates spokesperson said the congressman's public calls for mass pardons had nothing to do with the, quote, false and increasingly bizarre partisan allegations against him. The Department of Justice is investigating whether Gates had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old girl and paid for her to travel with him, potentially violating sex trafficking laws. The investigation started last summer under Trump Attorney General Bill Barr. In a book released last year, Gates wrote about politicians and sex scandals and said that Trump sometimes called him with advice on his social life. He's called me to talk sports and to give me advice on my romantic misadventures. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. And John, the former president breaking his silence on Gates today, but any sense whether Trump world is really trying to avoid any further connection to the congressman after these allegations? There really is no indication of that. In fact, uh, Lindsey, uh, Congressman Gates is the featured speaker coming up uh, this weekend at an event at the uh, Doral, the Trump Doral Club, an event that is sponsored by a group formerly known as Women for Trump. It's a pro-Trump women's group, a group that was also one of the primary sponsors of the rally on January 6th outside the White House uh, that immediately preceded the Capitol riot. So they are having uh, Gates there as one of their featured speakers. But in Interesting that he did not give him that pardon when he requested it early on. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Next, today, authorities released the official report of their investigation into Tiger Woods' horrific traffic accident that left his SUV a mangled heap off the side of a California road in late February. The L.A. County Sheriff saying Woods was going nearly twice the speed limit at the time. The question, did he mean to hit the brakes but hit the gas instead? Our Matt Gutman reports. Tonight, six weeks after that crash nearly sheared off the front of Tiger Woods' car, the L.A. Sheriff's Department concluding speed alone caused the wreck. The primary causal factor for this traffic collision was driving at a speed unsafe for the road conditions and the inability to negotiate the curve of the roadway. He was going up to 87 miles per hour, nearly twice the 45 mile per hour speed limit. And according to the investigation, the car's so-called black box shows that instead of slamming on the brakes, Woods hit the gas. It is speculated and believed that Tiger Woods inadvertently hit the accelerator instead of the brake pedal. This aerial image showing the collision points as his car went rocketing over a median, across a road, through brush, and then crashing into a tree at 75 miles per hour. But the car still had momentum. The impact of the vehicle when it hit the tree caused the vehicle to go airborne and do a somewhat pirouette landing on its side. Police say Woods driving was unsafe, but not reckless and not under the influence. There were no open containers in the vehicle and there were no narcotics or any evidence of medication uh, in the vehicle or on his person. Authorities say he won't even be cited for speeding because there were no witnesses to the accident. The sheriff insisting Woods got no special treatment. And tonight, Woods tweeting a statement thanking first responders who pried him out of that crumpled SUV for helping me so expertly at the scene and getting me safely to the hospital. There, Woods underwent emergency surgery. Doctors inserting a metal rod in his right tibia to stabilize the shattered bones, screws and pins also implanted into his foot and ankle. Injuries which have forced the golf great to undergo a series of additional procedures. Woods missing out on his beloved Masters tournament this week. The return to glory. Which he won in spectacular fashion in his last comeback in 2019, celebrating his fifth Masters with that hug from his son. So many remember that comeback. Our thanks to Matt. And when we come back, the man taking out his trash when police officers assume without evidence that he's the suspect they're looking for. What happens next and the lawsuit that's just been filed. My wide-ranging conversation with Oscar nominee Andra Day, the icon who inspired her and the self-doubt she has battled throughout her career. But up next, the heartbreaking tragedy for one family that led to eternal gratitude for others. Stay with us.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Do you believe? Do you believe? reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. No other country in the world sees gun violence numbers like here in the United States. Every day in this country, someone loses their life to firearms. But rather than just read statistics, let's show you. These are the faces of Americans who have been shot and died. Real people who didn't have to lose their lives but did. The National Gun Violence Memorial, a nonprofit website run by volunteers, gathers the pictures of the deceased. The staggering loss of humanity is now a daunting daily task. Maria Tritico is one of those faces. Her family, as any would be, devastated. But their grief has been met with some hope from some of the lives that Maria saved through her untimely death. Kaylee Hartung brings us this powerful story. Every moment, she was always very thoughtful to everyone's needs. She just wanted everyone to feel comfortable. Maria Tritico never saw a problem that didn't have a solution. When you're raising kids, you don't know if they're listening to you when you're talking because they're generally rolling their eyes. But Maria heard every word we said. Her parents, Chris and Debbie, say Maria was always passionate about serving and helping others, which inspired her to become an art therapist. Maria and her fiance Chad traveled the world together and had just started building a life together in Florida. Our jobs and passions were aligning. We had a community around us, a family to support our ideas, and so we were moving forward. It was supposed to be a Sunday like many others. On December 6th, Maria and Chad headed down to the beach on Singer Island. I have this great group of friends that I play ultimate frisbee with. And so every Sunday in the evening, we would all meet and socially distance ourselves. And we would throw frisbee and just catch up. And it was a good time. During a break in the game, all of a sudden, gunshots. I think there was three or four shots. And you could hear like a, like a ricochet. And immediately after that, I. Um, you know, saw Maria leaned over. Police say a witness told them the suspect admitted to shooting three times at a rival group that his family was feuding with. Police say one of those bullets struck Tritico in the head. I remember yelling for help, telling friends to call for 911, um, holding her, uh, 
trying to tell her, you know, that uh, I love her. At their home in Texas, Chris and Debbie receiving a phone call no parent can be prepared for. I don't know how to help in that situation. And I always know what to do. But I didn't know what to do then. I didn't know how to help my daughter. Six hours later, what felt like an eternity, the Triticos met Chad at the hospital. And we got to the hospital, and the second we walked in, I knew... I knew my daughter was dead. <laughs> Maria was just 32 years old. The hospital informed the family she'd signed up to be an organ donor. So he said, if you know someone who needs an organ, if you'll give me their name, we'll put them at the top of the list. And I said, I happen to know somebody. That somebody was Donna Hawkins. She and her husband, Bill, were longtime opponents with Chris in the courtroom. I've been a defense attorney my entire career, a little over 32 years now, and Donna and Bill were prosecutors at the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Even though Chris and I were adversaries in the courtroom, we treated each other with respect, with kindness, yeah. and we became friends. For decades, Donna had been struggling through the pain of polycystic kidney disease. It is a disease where small cysts form in the kidneys, and over time they grow and impede kidney function. Um, a normal kidney is the size of a fist or a little bit smaller. Mine grew to bigger than footballs. She was a lot sicker um, than she would let people know, and it finally just got to the point where she couldn't function any longer as a lawyer. In the final months of 2020, her condition was quickly getting worse. I prayed for freedom from the pain, however it could be. I prayed for a donor. I didn't realize it at the time, but my family were actually preparing in a small way in case I did not make it. On a daily basis, what was the pain like? The worst pain imaginable. I've had two children and childbirth was nothing compared to how I felt. Donna was in desperate need of a kidney transplant. Doctors say the average wait for a transplant can be four to five years. There's a lot more demand than supply, unfortunately. When you're waiting for a transplant, uh, you put your life on hold. And you never know if you're going to make it to the finish line or not. Time was running out for Donna. I had several people that came forward, but none that were a match. With an O blood type, you can only accept from another O donor. And so our options were somewhat limited. Until Maria. Until Maria. In the Tritico family's darkest moment, Chris called Bill. I said, did Donna get a kidney? And he said no. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, we're going to give him Bruno Maria's. The gift, potentially life-saving, but both families had to wait days to learn if the pair would be a match. Chris just turned our world upside down for us. I'll never forget speaking with the Mayo Clinic representative who used the words, you and Maria are a perfect match. Is there any way to describe the feeling of hearing those words? Elation and yet still devastation for my friends. Happy that I was gonna live and make it, and still incredibly devastated for them. That's the only, the only thing we had in this nightmare, the only thing we could hold on to, is that something good was happening. <laughs> that she, she was a miracle for somebody else. Yeah. Less than a week after Maria's life was cut tragically short, Donna went into the surgery that would save hers. Donna was lucky in the sense that she got a very wonderful gift, a very wonderful kidney. If she takes good care of this kidney, which I'm sure she will, this kidney could last her for the rest of her life. Today in the U.S., more than 100,000 people are waiting for an organ transplant. Maria's kidneys, liver, and lungs were all successfully donated after her death. We're going to be sad for the rest of our lives that our daughter died. But in that moment of sadness, her death gave Donna and three other people life. And we're glad. And we're glad that you got that. Okay? We always, we always will be.
We always will be. She's my angel. She's just an absolute angel, and I, I feel like she is and always will be a part of me. A dear friend gave me a bracelet with Maria's name on it, and um, I look at my wrist several times each day, and I think of Maria, and not a day goes by where I don't say prayers of gratitude every morning and every evening for Maria and for the entire Tritico family and Chad. I want to be a better person because she's with me. Kaylee Hartung, ABC News, Los Angeles. What a touching story. Our thanks to Kaylee for bringing that to us. Still ahead here on Prime, the death ruled accidental and the outraged parents who believe their child was the latest victim of hazing. He introduced generations of audiences to wildlife from around the world. The animals were always the star, but tonight Jack Hanna is at the center of the story. And what we learned today about the reproductive lifespan of women, we take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day on this so-called National Beer Day, a message from Natty Light. <laughs> Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to a new study that finds that women in the U.S. may be experiencing menopause at a later age and may have slightly more reproductive years overall than they did 40 years ago. We take a look by the numbers. 49.9 years old, that's the average age that women in the U.S. reach menopause. It's actually an increase from 48.4 years ago, the average age four decades ago, according to researchers at the University of Pennsylvania and Temple University. Meanwhile, 12.7 years old is now the average age that girls in the U.S. get their first period. That's younger than 13 and a half years ago, the average age 40 years ago, which means on average women in the U.S. now have 37.1 reproductive years, also known as our reproductive lifespan, an increase of 2.1 years from a generation ago. 
ABC News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. Jennifer Ashton says that broadening of reproductive years could mean a slight decrease in cardiovascular disease in women, but could also raise the risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer, which are hormonally responsive. Still lots more to get to tonight here on Prime. My conversation with Andrew Day and her battle with a feeling that so many of us have, and the growing calls to boycott the 2022 Winter Olympics in China, why some say they should not be rewarded for human rights violations, and their response from the U.S. Olympic Committee. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. Made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Today, an expert on the use of force is Sergeant Jody Steiger of the LAPD testifying Derek Chauvin used a deadly force against George Floyd at a time when no force was necessary. Prosecutors asking whether Floyd posed a threat. No, he did not. Why not? Because he was in the prone position, he was handcuffed, um, he was not attempting to resist. The defense has argued the crowd of bystanders were a threat. I did not perceive them as being a threat. Most of it was their concern for Mr. Floyd. Chauvin's lawyers returning again and again to Floyd's drug use, arguing his opioid addiction led to his death. You've seen sort of a white substance forming around Mr. Floyd's mouth? Yes. That would be consistent in your experience with someone who's possibly using controlled substances? Correct. Another disturbing police body cam video released as part of a lawsuit alleging racial profiling by the LAPD. In the video from 2019, officers look for a suspect in a domestic violence call. That's when they come across Anton Austin taking out his trash. Without any evidence, the two officers arrest him. Turn around for me. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around because I told you to turn around. The only problem, he's not the man they're looking for. In fact, the suspect they're supposed to be looking for is white. What are you doing, man? Jeez. Yo, you're looking 
looking for the people upstairs, bro. I don't know. Relax. Austin's girlfriend, Michelle, runs out to intervene. She's also arrested. The couple's attorney says the arrest continued even after the woman who originally placed the 911 call told officers they were arresting the wrong man. An autopsy report confirms what these grieving parents say happened to their son during an alleged college hazing incident. A medical examiner says 20-year-old Stone Foltz died from fatal alcohol intoxication. But the family expressed outrage that the report also ruled the Bowling State sophomore's death accidental. His family insists Foltz was forced to drink during a fraternity ritual. The outcome is he, he was murdered. Earlier, the family spoke with our Will Reeve. I can't describe the pain. I mean, there's a piece of my heart that's gone. On March 4th, the night of the tragedy, Stone telling his mother about a scheduled drinking ritual he felt forced to participate in. And I said, well, that sounds really stupid. Why do you have to do it? And he said, it's just part of the ritual. I have to, but I don't want to. Authorities say fraternity members encourage pledges to drink entire bottles of alcohol. China is letting the administration know that it would be best not to talk about any boycott before next year's Winter Olympics. The Communist Party in Beijing is accused of committing genocide against people in northwest China and has been criticized for its laws and police crackdown in Hong Kong. A foreign ministry spokesman in Beijing has rejected the accusations and warns of an unspecified, robust Chinese response to any such boycott move. Our position on the 2022 Olympics has not changed. We have not discussed and are not discussing any joint boycott with allies and partners. The U.S. Olympic Committee has said in the past it's opposed to boycotts. Famous zookeeper Jack Hanna has been diagnosed with dementia that is thought to be Alzheimer's disease. A 74-year-old has been serving as director emeritus of Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, but Hanna is retiring from public life because of this diagnosis. He was director of the zoo from 1978 to 1992. He was also a longtime contributor on Good Morning America. This little animal here gets to be about 40, 50 pounds called a serval cat, can jump in midair eight feet and catch a bird, just like the one you're holding called the character. Daughters say that their dad advocated for improved wildlife habitats and focused on connecting the community with the animals. Welcome back. She is an Oscar winning actress and Oscar nominated actress and the singer and songwriter for what has become an anthem for the Black Lives Matter movement. Andra Day sat down with me for an interview as part of ABC's Soul of a Nation, where she opened up about her experience playing the legendary Billie Holiday. She shares that initially she didn't want the role and suffered from imposter syndrome. She also talks about how she's reimagined strange fruit and race relations in our country. Let's start with the Oscar nomination. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Take us to that moment when you found out. My phone started blowing up and that's when I knew I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, but it's funny, I prayed about it even the night before and I had a very sense of, strong sense of peace, you know what I mean? And, and so I, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I was like, all right, I receive it. And then the next morning we got the announcement and I just, just feels like, it feels actually surreal a little mm. bit, you know what I mean? To do just as I want to. So you've already won the Golden Globe. Only the second black woman to win for Best Actress since Whoopi Goldberg in The Color Purple. Whoopi Goldberg! <laughs> What do you make of it taking nearly four decades for another black woman to win? Yeah, I'm so, so grateful for the award, but it's not lost on me that, you know, for 35 plus years, you know, that um, black women were really made to feel sort of inadequate in this space, you know, and, 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 and by whose standards, you know, it's one of those things that they've been giving stellar performances, you know, for, for such a long time. And as we know, we, we have to often work sort of above and beyond. So. Um, my hope, obviously, is that it's not even my hope. It cannot take another 35 years. He knows. We love you. When I take and the blue.
NAACP says Billie Holiday is the voice of our people. We talk about Strange Fruit, perhaps arguably the ultimate protest song. Mm -hmm. But then Rise Up as well became this soundtrack and anthem for the Black Lives Matter movement. And I rise up, I rise like the day I will rise up, I rise on a friend, I rise. What was your reaction to that? Uh, that was, you know, it just felt like, it, it felt like sort of preordination, right? It was, it, it didn't, because with Rise Up, it wasn't like I went in and I was like, I want to make an anthem and I want this to change people's lives. To be honest with you, I just, I felt a little exhausted. It was the first time in my life, I think I was just questioning whether music was something that I, I was going to do for a living. And it was scary for me because I didn't have a, 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 a fall plan, right? I, I never had a plan B. So I, I really prayed in my car and just asked, it was a surrender moment. I said, God, whatever you want to say, you know, what do you want to hear? What do you want me to write? And to see it adopted by the Black Lives Matter movement just means it's bigger than I, I could have imagined. You've mentioned a, a number of times prayer and God, yeah. and, and I want to see if you can remember the moment that you said you were praying and reading scripture yeah. when you changed your mind about doing the United I mean, States yeah. versus Billie Holiday. <laughs> it was a story about Peter being caused to walk on water, you know? Mm. And it was the first time I read it and realized he never asked God to make the storm go away. And I think that's what I was asking for. It was like, make the movie go away. Just make it easy for me to get out of this. Make it easy. And so it was the first time I read that and realized, after I've read it a million times, and realized he didn't ask him to make the storm go away. He didn't ask him to make him safer. He didn't, he asked him to cause him to get out of the boat and walk on water as he did. And so that's when I was, I, I believe I was moved to my spirit. It was like, you're being called to do an act of great faith right now. To, so the storm gonna be here, <laughs> let it be. <laughs> but to just trust, you know, and yeah. And the interesting parable of, of Peter being called to walk on the water, it was really a, ultimately about doubt, yeah, right? Absolutely. And self-doubt, which mm -hmm. you have expressed oh with taking this role. And there was so much that you went through, right? Because you don't smoke, you don't drink, mm -hmm. you've been abstinent, yeah. and you've lost 40 pounds. So when we talk about the physical and mental and emotional angst, mm -hmm. was it harder to overcome the self-doubt? I think that was the hardest thing to overcome. For me, it was the self-doubt, like I said, I deal with, now it has the term, I guess, is imposter syndrome or something like that now. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I deal with that. But I think we all do too. To a degree, you know, depending on where we are. But I didn't realize how deep that self-doubt was and that those feelings of inadequacy and 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 like like I said, that imposter syndrome. Um, so it was really having to trust and um, and just say I've been equipped. Like with whatever it is that I need for this thing, I have to trust. I'm also my worst critic, so I'm gonna look at everything and be like, oh, why didn't I have to make this choice here? Why didn't I make this? But actually, once I saw it come together. I don't know. It was magic. You've said that there were parts of Billy that you weren't ready to let go of. Like what? Billy sort of has this kind of, and I have it too a little bit, but to a different degree. You know, she's like on another level. <laughs> she kind of has this aloofness, this falling into whatever thing, you know, which can be amazing, and sometimes it can be pretty damn toxic. <laughs> and I was like, listen, there's something about toxicity that can feel kind of good. You know what I mean? Like, I think, well, she's an addiction. It's difficult, difficult to let her go, you know? Hard to quit her. Yeah, it feels like I feel safer and more free kind of in her trying to operate in the world, if that makes sense. What is your favorite Billie Holiday song? Oh my God. A pretty consistent one, I will say, is God Bless the Child. But God bless the child that's got his own. That's got his own. Oh, and I also love the lovable, huggable Miss Brown to you who is baby to me. Lovable, huggable Emily Brown. Miss Brown to you. Anything that surprised you? about Billie Holiday? I think just the degree, right? The sort of um, viciousness with which they went after her, I think is what surprised me and also just reminded me like this woman shouldered all of this on her own. I think that was also a big surprise, you know? Not a big surprise, but it was a revelation really. Mm. You know, I, I know about it, but then when you're in her skin and you're living in it, you realize this was pre the reinvigorated civil rights movement. You know, she was really her singing that song reinvigorated the movement. 
Uh, so that means she was shouldering all of this, you know, on her own with her dealing with the addiction, them trying to keep her addicted and to kill her and to destroy her for it. And dealing with her trauma and loneliness and 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 the oppression and the entire government going after us like, whoa, you know, I, I, it's a wonder she made it even to 44, you know, with everything that was against her. So, but she did. My next guest. And there's a the part in the movie when she's being interviewed and he asks, um, you know, why is the government always going after you? And mm -hmm. she says, my song, yeah. Strange Fruit. It reminds them that they're killing us. Reminds them. It reminds you too, Reginald. Southern trees. Get her off that stage. Do you feel that a song has that much power? Absolutely it does. I always say that the system of racial inequality, right, is a system where they have to control the narrative, and they have for a very long time, and where they have to suppress it, where they have to lie. A song like Strange Fruit is a really healthy dose of truth. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Let's talk about how timely Strange Fruit still is and relevant today. I thought it was so interesting, the framing of how the movie starts out with the Senate, with the anti-lynching bill Absolutely. before them. They were considering that, but it wasn't passed. Still today yep. has not been passed. I think that's a part of the issue, right? Because it was something that was still legal while murder was illegal. And if you really understand what lynching is, it has nothing to do with a rope. People don't want to acknowledge that this bill is wholly entrenched in race when the police gang up, and it specifically targets the police, you know, which I think that's what people are so reluctant to talk about. Yeah, when there's a mob of you standing on a man's back and on his neck and targeting him, what are you targeting him for? We watched George Floyd be lynched, you know, we saw that, you know, we saw him crying out for his mother. We watched that happen to Ahmaud Arbery. Khalif Browder was a huge one for me as well. Camera set. Tigress and Tweed. To me, it sounds like the evolution of Strange Fruit. Yes, yes. <laughs> Give us a sense of where it came from. One of the questions in my mind was, if Billie Holiday were alive today, how would she have wanted to see Strange Fruit evolved, right? And one of the first things that came to mind was, take them off the tree, get off mm. the tree, you know. Fruit stand tall. Fruit stand tall, these, these roots, roots go deep. deep, you know what I mean? Strain, you know, and, and, and cut it down under your feet. I wanted to feel like, Liberation. I wanted it to feel, you know, like we were mobilized and unified. Mm -hmm. Say, 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 say a prayer for me. Strange fruit come down off that tree. Our thanks to Andrew Day for that conversation. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. This is the moment a monk was rescued from a flooded cave in Thailand. An unseasonal rainstorm trapped him inside over the weekend, but 17 divers participated in the effort to find and then free him. All this, of course, reminiscent of the 12 Thai boys that made national headlines when they were freed from a cave back in 2018. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. The new potential COVID vaccine being developed at Walter Reed by the Army and how it could be like nothing that's been authorized so far. The mayor breaking barriers. What she will do to bridge the divide in her city. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news.
most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. We've suspected it, and now the CDC director has confirmed it. The highly contagious UK variant is now the dominant strain of coronavirus in the U.S. Five states now account for nearly half of all new infections, and health officials say young people appear to be driving the surge. The White House says half of all adults in the U.S. could be at least partially vaccinated by the end of the month. Authorities have now released their investigation report into the crash that severely injured golf superstar Tiger Woods. Speed is to blame. The L.A. County Sheriff's Office says Woods was going nearly twice the speed limit at the time that his SUV careened off the side of a California road. In a statement, Tiger said that he is grateful for the Good Samaritans who came to assist him and called 911. He says he is now focused on family and his recovery. And now to embattled Florida Congressman Matt Gates. He is under federal investigation for alleged sex trafficking. According to sources, he lobbied former President Trump for a blanket pardon during the end of Trump's term. Trump denies the allegation and defended his fellow Floridian, saying that Gates has, quote, totally denied the accusations against him. Gates may have never directly asked the former president, but multiple former Trump administration officials tell ABC News that he urged White House staffers for a preemptive pardon. Now to the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin, the prosecution and defense going back and forth today on what George Floyd said as he was being detained, each side hoping it bolsters their argument. Alex Perez reports. Today, an expert on the use of force is Sergeant Jody Steiger of the LAPD testifying Derek Chauvin used a deadly force against George Floyd at a time when no force was necessary. Prosecutors asking whether Floyd posed a threat. No, he did not. And why not? Because he was in the prone position, he was handcuffed, um, he was not attempting to resist. The defense has argued the crowd of bystanders were a threat. I did not perceive them as being a threat. And, and why is that? Uh, because they were merely filming and they were, most of it was their concern for Mr. Floyd. Chauvin's lawyers returning again and again to Floyd's drug use, arguing his opioid addiction led to his death. You've seen sort of a white substance forming around Mr. Floyd's mouth? Yes. That would be consistent in your experience with someone who's possibly using controlled substances? Correct. The defense playing this body cam video to the chief investigator in the case, James Ryerson. Listen closely. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. Did it appear that Mr. Floyd said, I ate too many drugs? Yes, it did. But later, the prosecution playing an earlier portion of that same tape. Is there a discussion about drug use by the officers and attempting to speak to Mr. Floyd? Yes. yes. Having heard it in context, are you able to tell uh, what Mr. Floyd is saying there? Yes, I believe Mr. Floyd was saying, I ain't do no drugs. Late today, a forensic investigator on the case acknowledging that when she searched the police squad car where officers had struggled with Floyd, she missed a few pills, which were later determined to have Floyd's DNA on them. Didn't have any information that I was looking for anything like a pill or resembling a pill. So at the time, I 
didn't um, give it any forensic significance. The defense is arguing that Floyd spit the drugs out in his tussle with police. Alex, thank you. For more analysis, we bring in attorney Lance LaRusso. He's represented dozens of police officers. He's also the author of the book, When Cops Kill, The Aftermath of a Critical Incident. Thank you so much for joining us. What was your general impression of today? Was it a good day for the prosecution, would you say? It's a good day for the prosecution, and I think that they uh, combined the witnesses. They had two very strong witnesses from the uh, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension trying to get more information, also the expert witnesses so far as use of force, and kind of as a precursor to get into the chemistry. And the past couple of things that we've heard from these witnesses is going to be very difficult for the uh, prosecution. We're hearing that there were drugs uh, with methamphetamine and fentanyl, and it's probably the first time the jury's really started to hear about that, not only in George Floyd's vehicle, but also in the back of the patrol vehicle. So the jury's going to start getting into some medical evidence, and this is probably a good way to introduce them to it. And were you aware or were you able to tell what was said when we heard George Floyd uh, talking? You know, reporters who were inside the courtroom described the jury as really leaning in at that point. And I guess there's basically a dispute between whether he said, I ain't take no drugs or I ate too many drugs. I could not make it out. I've actually heard that portion of the video before. I've heard people play it. It's been all over social media and things. The question is, what effect did it have on the officers? If the officers believed he had taken a lot of drugs, then what efforts were being taken as soon as he stopped resisting and as soon as he went limp to get him immediate medical attention? And that's where the depraved mind, that's where the intent to cause injury, that's where depriving medical treatment is going to get to that culpable negative negligence uh, standard for the second degree manslaughter. Because as an officer, that's your duty, right? You, you're responsible basically for getting medical treatment at a certain point, correct? You are. And I've represented officers who have been shot at, who have shot a suspect and immediately put their gun back in the holster and put a tourniquet on the individual who was trying to kill them. That's what officers talk about when they talk about a warrior mentality. They have to be able to switch from one world to another, and they become the lifesaver, even though that person was intending to cause them harm. That is going to be the biggest issue for the defense to overcome, is the lack of medical treatment after clearly George Floyd was not not a threat to anyone. Now, the defense suggested again that Derek Chauvin's knee was on Floyd's shoulder blades or the base of his neck and not on the neck itself. They're also arguing that Chauvin's full weight was not on Floyd. Take a listen now to Chauvin's attorney questioning police use of force expert Sergeant Jody Steiger. And the specific technique that you're trained is for an officer to put his knee into what would be the like the trapezius area in between the shoulder blades at the base of the neck yes right? the base of the neck and that is standard protocol standard police practice and basically in every single department that you're familiar with that i'm familiar with yes now from the trial video you've seen does it look like chauvin may have been on floyd's shoulder or the base of his neck and if that's true how strong of a defense would that be I think it's probably, just like any other confrontation, his knee was probably moving around. I found it very hard to believe when I first heard the description that his knee was on his neck for nine minutes. It's extremely difficult to keep anyone in a position um, like that for that long. So I would expect, and I expected when I heard the trial starting, that there would be testimony that his knee was everywhere from the middle of his shoulder blades up to his neck. So when we're looking at the compression of his rib cage as opposed to the compression of his neck, you've heard a lot about positional asphyxia. The question is going to be is whether or not his actions actually caused the death by a deprivation of oxygen and or making it difficult for him to breathe. I'd like to also ask about another defense argument from today, the suggestion that Floyd's words, I can't breathe, when police were trying to get him into the car, this was before Chauvin put his knee on Floyd's neck. Was Floyd resisting arrest then at that moment, and, and does that help Chauvin's case? Well, it's going to come up to a lot of perception. So you have several officers there, and that's a real question as to whether or not any of them are going to testify. And I don't know that Derek Chauvin's going to testify. Uh, you know, the jury can look at the video, and as you've seen, it's difficult to get somebody in the back of a patrol car if they are not anything other than cooperative. So if the person is either moving around or squirming or not wanting to get into the car, not shifting their hips, or just standing up straight and preventing you from putting them in the car, it is a form of physical 
resistance. And lastly, taking a step back now, the state's use of force expert testified that George Floyd did not pose a threat to the officers on the scene that day. From what you've seen and heard in this case, do you think that that's true? When he was on the ground, without a doubt, there was no use of force by George Floyd. There was no resistance by George Floyd, which would justify a use of force by the officers, especially towards the end of that interaction. And one of the things that's very good about this is the public is finally, finally seeing exactly what type of research and analysis goes into the use of force by an officer, especially when a death occurs. So we have chemistry, we have um, pictures, we have video, everything being analyzed. and. All all of these factors lead to that case, Graham versus Connor, where the officer's actions are judged based on what the officer knows at the time and the actions of the suspect. The officer's actions are always reactive, which sometimes makes law enforcement extremely dangerous. But when there is no reaction from the suspect, when there is no resistance, there's supposed to be a consummate drop in force. So there is no force being used if there's no force or resistance by the suspect. Attorney Lance LaRusso, appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. President Biden spent much of the day trying to sell the American public on his massive infrastructure plan, pushing back on GOP lawmakers who say the $2 trillion plan is too expensive and contains agenda items that don't have anything to do with infrastructure. But the president also signaled that he is willing to compromise on some items. ABC's Ike Jachi has the latest from Washington. The president at the White House Wednesday speaking to Americans about his more than $2 trillion infrastructure plan. It's a plan that puts millions of Americans to work to fix what's broken in our country. Mr. Biden redefining infrastructure, saying this once-in-a-generation investment is about a lot more than just roads and bridges. The idea of infrastructure has always evolved to meet the aspirations of the American people and their needs. And it's evolving again today. The president's plan calls for more than $300 billion for mass transit, roads, airports, and bridges. It also includes $45 billion to replace lead pipes, $100 billion to expand broadband internet, $174 billion is earmarked for creating the infrastructure needed for electric cars, and $400 billion to expand care and housing for the elderly and people with disabilities. To pay for it, the president is suggesting a corporate tax hike from 21 to 28 percent over the next 15 years, reversing a key component of the Trump administration's tax reform bill. The plan receiving support from the corporate world, Amazon's Jeff Bezos signaling his approval for the bill. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. Every business leader I talk to, big and small, agrees we must make these investments in infrastructure in order to compete. Meanwhile, key Republicans like Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell claim the bill is too costly and say it fails to address infrastructure needs. It's a whopping tax increase on the most productive parts of our society, society but there's more money in there for electric cars than there are for roads and bridges. White House officials say they realize they'll have to make concessions to the bill in order for it to get passed, something White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says President Biden is willing to do. Lindsay? Ike Ijachi, our thanks to you. As of today, more than 64 million Americans have been fully vaccinated for the coronavirus with doses produced by Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. But at Walter Reed, military scientists are now working on testing what they hope will be the vaccine of the future to tackle the threat, not just from COVID-19 variants, but also other future pandemics. Our Bob Woodruff got an inside look in this week's Vaccine Watch. This week, military scientists are launching a phase one clinical trial for their still experimental shot. While the U.S. has already authorized three vaccines against COVID-19, the mission here is to produce new vaccines to defeat current and future variants. Retired U.S. Army Colonel Francis Holonady stepping up the volunteer at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. When it dawned on me that they were trying to do a trial for the COVID-19, I saw this as another opportunity to just serve. Walter Reed researchers gave us an exclusive tour of their lab just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, we sit in the Army Futures Command here uh, at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, and the Army Futures Command was created only a few years ago 
to tackle the wars of the future, not fight the wars of the past. These scientists know their vaccine won't be the country's first defense against COVID-19, also known as SARS-CoV-2. They're aiming for a shotgun approach, targeting multiple variants and closely related viruses. In, in the startup, we're, we're, we're behind the curve, but what we're seeing when we test against these variants, and even going back to 2003 with the SARS-1 virus, this type of immune response that we're getting is actually very broad. Do you honestly think we will have another, will there be a SARS-3, a SARS-4? So uh, in the back caves out there, there are definitely other coronaviruses that have that potential. So that's where now's the time to strike and really make sure that that does not happen. Walter Reed scientists say versatility is key. My, my first ever uh, birthday gift as a, I think as a teenager was a Swiss Army life, which I loved. And this is very much like a Swiss Army. Well, whereas other knives only have one blade. That's right. Unlike currently authorized COVID-19 shots in the U.S., which rely on genetic instructions to rev up the immune system, the vaccines they're studying here are made of protein that mimics the structure of the virus. The closer you get to something that looks like a virus, the better response you're going to get to that virus and related viruses as well. Uh, so these are the red ones then. So, I, so we have three. We get Pfizer. Uh, Moderna. And, Moderna, right. Yeah, and Johnson and & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson. Those are all vaccines that are fighting against just that one particular virus. That's right. Current vaccines are just targeting this one line here. Just the top one. What we're trying to do initially and what we're close to right now, we think, is all of this. And what we're going to get to next is the rest of this. The long-term goal, the moonshot here, is to get the entire family, not just the small branches, not just the big branches, not just the trunk and the roots, but the entire tree. Although they say their data looks good in monkeys, they still have a major hurdle to overcome, proving it works and is safe in humans. They have some very early data to suggest in the laboratory that the immune response evoked by this vaccine will cover a variety of different strains. Now, whether that translates actually into protection in people against a variety of strains, that remains to be determined. Long journeys, first steps. But if successful, this would be a vaccine that could be used across the globe without the cumbersome frozen storage requirements of some other vaccines. The motto of our institute is soldier health, world health. It's so tied together. So products, vaccines that we're making for our soldiers are really global products, ones that can be accessed globally. While still in early stages of clinical trials, the hope is that these new types of vaccines will keep the world one step ahead of the next pandemic. Many different ways to, to serve. Uh, you don't have to be in the military, you don't have to be a first responder, but you can help all. And if you have a calling to help people, this is just one of the ways you can do it. This is Bob Woodruff, tracking the vaccine. So important. We stay one step ahead. Our thanks to Bob Woodruff for that. And still to come, the unusual response from the president of Brazil after he was asked about lockdowns as that nation now crosses a daily death threshold of 4,000. And the mayor who is breaking barriers and how she plans to unify her divided city. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their <laughs> shoes, then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. 
You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Brazil has once again crossed a grim COVID milestone. 4,165 people died Tuesday from the virus. That's their highest daily toll yet. The surge is linked to a variant from that nation, but Brazil's president continues to resist calls to impose a lockdown. When asked if he would do so today, his response, lockdown makes you fat. And a bizarre moment outside Myanmar's embassy in London. Its ambassador was locked out after speaking out against the coup and calling for the release of the country's leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. The Myanmar military's brutal crackdown on the opposition has led to hundreds of deaths, including dozens of children, according to human rights groups. For the first time, Jordan's King Abdullah has addressed allegations that his half-brother was involved in a plot to destabilize his kingdom. He wrote a letter to the nation that was read on national TV. He said his uncle is now handling the matter. President Biden called the king and expressed his solidarity. It is time for St. Louis to thrive. Those were the words uttered by the first black woman elected mayor for the city of St. Louis last night. Tashara Jones ran on a platform focused on transparency, integrity, and service, and has promised the people of St. Louis that she will not stay silent when she spots injustice. She joins us now, and, and she joins also an exclusive sorority of black women who are at the helm of some of our nation's largest cities. Mayor-elect Tashara Jones, thanks so much for joining us tonight and congratulations on your big win. Yes, thank you for having me. Has the reality set in yet of the, the win and the responsibility that you're about to take on? Yes, it has, and it's uh, hitting me like a ton of bricks, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm ready. I can imagine. Now, you've promised to bring fresh air to the city. What do you mean by that? So St. Louis has been plagued by um, a whole host of issues that have permeated our policymaking decisions for decades, like racism, the unequal delivery of city services, and access to health care. Uh, we've recently had one of our most violent years on record uh, in, in terms of uh, gun violence and also police-involved violence. And so we need uh, uh, to—we have elected a mayor, uh, me, namely, uh, to, move, uh, to move us forward into the 21st century. Uh, we have to address uh, these issues head on. Uh, we also have to address racism head on in our city. We're one of the most hyper-segregated cities in the country, and we have to embrace that and uh, have these hard conversations about it so we can move forward. And, and you talked about the violence there. You know, the issues facing your city are quite complicated, especially when it comes to the homicide rate, which is one of the highest in the nation. How will your commitment of transparency, integrity, and service translate into action when it comes to getting that homicide rate in particular under control. 
So crime and violence doesn't stop at our borders, and our solutions shouldn't either. And so I am prepared to uh, usher in a new uh, era of collaboration and cooperation with our neighbors to the west and the east. Uh, we're on the eastern edge of, of the state of Missouri, and um, we share a border with Illinois. Um, and I am ready to engage our neighbors to have some real hard conversations and declare gun violence as a public health crisis so we can all bring all the prevention tools to the table. And part of your vision for policing is about shifting from arrest and incarceration to prevention. However, just this week, inmates staged an uprising, as you know, at the St. Louis jail, the second one just this year. What's your plan when it comes to listening to the demands of those who are currently incarcerated and prevent yet another uprising? Yeah, so one of the reasons uh, why they are uh, uprising is because uh, this jail was not meant to hold people for uh, for long periods of time. Uh, and so because of COVID, our court systems uh, have been halted. We haven't had jury trials. And so we need to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office as well as our local state courts uh, to see how we can move people through the system uh, and work with our circuit attorney to see who really needs to be held there. We have about 800 people currently uh, in our system, about 200 on federal charges. Um, and we need to see which ones are violent. Obviously, if they are violent, they need to be held. But if not, if they're like simple parole violations, uh, things that uh, can be monitored in the community, then we need to investigate that uh, and let these people uh, get back to their lives and their livelihoods. Last year, we held a virtual roundtable on the show with four black female mayors, and we talked about their unique positioning during the height, in particular, of the summer of protests. Do you feel that your race and gender put you at increased scrutiny or, or put you in a unique position at this time? I think it's a little of both. Um, you know, again, St. Louis ha is one of the most hyper-segregated uh, cities in the country, and this race in particular um, had a lot of uh, dog whistles um, and a lot of gaslighting by uh, by some of our uh, white progressive friends. And so we have to uh, make sure that we are telling the truth about that. Um, but also, I think I feel like I'm in a unique position to lead because I am a single mom of the most adorable 13-year-old son. Uh, and lead from a different place. Uh, I am I am trying to make sure that I create a St. Louis where children like him uh, are able to thrive and not just survive. And, and lastly, do you feel a weight or a particular responsibility in being labeled as the first black woman when you're tasked with working on the behalf of all races and genders? You know, I, I, I feel honored that I'm the first black woman to lead the, the city that I love so much. Um, and I often think of my grandparents who moved here from the South uh, to have a better life for their families or for my parents. And I am I embrace this challenge uh, with humility, uh, but also with the strength of my ancestors to make sure that I am leading St. Louis into the 21st century. Ms. Tashara Jones, first black female mayor elected in the city of St. Louis. We thank you so much for your time. Congratulations again. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us, and good night.